Michelle, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have you on. You're going to talk about something very important that's kind of different for the show. Although we did have a similar kind of call out when COVID started, like two years ago, ha had two guests on, had an open discussion. So why don't you let the audience know what we're going to be talking about today, what you're up to. And I think this is great information for everybody. Sure. So my name is Michelle Moore, and normally I um, am in the business space of helping people focus better, helping knowledge worker teams focus better. But my attention has been taken away from normal day to day business because of the war in Ukraine, because I worked in the region in the former Soviet Union for about 15 years. And that has really because I know so many people connected to this topic and personally and devastatingly impacted by this war, that I am moved to act. And so I would love to share today a little bit about what I'm doing and some inside stories on, on, on what's going on. Well, I think that's great. And I'm also interested in, you know, we, where you got all kinds of leaders on this, uh, listening to this podcast, should they be concerned? Should they be doing anything? Should they be talking to their people about it? What's appropriate? What's not? So, I mean, a lot of people are just like, hey, I'm so busy, I can't think about it. And if you want to challenge that, I'm open to it. So let's dive in. I would love to challenge that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what struck me to be candid was I don't, you know, I don't breeze through LinkedIn a lot, but I, I did like a week or so ago. And there was somebody who had posted confirming Yes, that photo you saw in the news service of the woman who'd been shot by Russian soldiers, along with her two daughters, unarmed, um, was our employee. And she had stayed behind and then couldn't get out and then was trying to get out. And the soldiers came upon her and just killed her. So it, it just shocked me. It was just like, we, we can't let things like that happen, uh, not in a civilized world. I agree, David. And I think one thing to mention on the outset here is I remember when the war in Syria was going on and in Canada at the time, also, there was a special visa program for refugees from that war happening. But I do feel like the rest of the world has more interest in the Ukraine war because the people look similar to them. And I think that is that mm. is a problem I will call out to begin with as well, this, this discrimination against how much we help brown refugees, black refugees versus white refugees. But what is also heartening, I think, you know, I'm speaking from the Canadian perspective that the Canadian government has issued this emergency travel visa program for an unlimited number of Ukrainians. And what struck me is that one of my best friends in Toronto is Ukrainian. And she reached out to her circle of friends, including me, on the first day when this happened and when, when the Russians began striking and said, you know, this is what's happening to my brother. This is what's happening to my father. What can we do? And so immediately we got together and said, let's start funding her father's sanatorium. A sanatorium is a health center. He employs doctors. Normally people go there for rest and rejuvenation and some physical therapy. But he was already, I think, day three or day four in receiving refugees from Kharkiv, one of the first bombed cities. And because people were losing their homes already, and he is able to house 250 people. And so Mila's husband, Daryl Brown, started this GoFundMe campaign to be able to enable her father to continue to pay salaries, to feed people, to clean the place, and to be able to receive refugees. So, so that's sort of the first anecdote that I will share. And that, that's been going on since the beginning. And you know, I'll pause there for a moment in case you want to ask a question or respond to that before I tell some other stories about helping people get visas. Well, first of all, I think it's really good I kind of like to hope that I wish that someday we could all be colorblind, but I think it's really great you brought up that in some countries, including the U.S. at times, um, you know, there can be more sense of urgency when, quote unquote, people look like us or like some of us who are in power. And I, I agree with you. I think that's a shame. It'd, it'd be really great if we could treat everybody equally all the time. So uh, otherwise, I'd like you to like you to go on. So, so you have the situation where there's one person that's helping out, 250 beds or whatever, probably filled up pretty quickly, I would think. 
still filling up because they have a hard time getting there, actually. Uh, oh, just okay. even moving or walking the distance is is difficult. So so there's still space and funding is currently enough for those that are there. I think the amount is like 50. Uh, so there's still a huge capacity, actually, to receive people because a lot of people are hesitant to flee internally. They're trying to go to the borders because that's mm. safer, but some have no choice or some don't have the means or the gas runs out or they can only go as far as they can walk. Um, so that's wow. the situation on the ground. Yeah. Wow. So what's happening with business leaders that, that you're speaking with in, in, for instance, Canada and the U.S.? Um, how are they approaching this situation, if, if at all, within their organization? So I can speak only to Canada right now. I'm only speaking with Canadian organizations at the moment. And the dialogue is there because there are so many Ukrainian immigrants and Ukrainian heritage people in all over Canada. So there is a lot of dialogue because virtually everyone knows someone of Ukrainian heritage, at least in my circle. So there has been effort to reach out. How can we help uh, what's going on with your family? And so what has happened in my case is that because this one very close friend of mine grew up in Ukraine and has a circle of cousins and brother and in-laws and father and friends that she went to school with, I said, look, my husband's a retired immigration counsel. I can easily help with visas. If I need advice, I can just talk to him. And I said, send me all the visa applications, anybody who wants to apply for this Canadian emergency visa. So I really became a visa administrator <laughs> and started doing these applications for people who, let's say, don't have very good English, can't fill it out, or we've got people. So I'm helping, I'm helping a family, or I've already helped a family who made it to Poland in the first couple of days, but their internet access was so poor. And they were trying to do this visa application on the phone, but they couldn't do it simply because of internet access. In this case, the family spoke English. And so that language wasn't a problem, but the internet access was. Then there is the case of a, a common law couple who made it to, to Hungary and the form doesn't provide for common law. So I consult my husband. I say, hey, how do we do this so that the two can get a visa together because they've lived together for two years, they're common law, but they have no documentation to support this. So coming up with these ways of, of telling the story so that there's going to be no question with the visa officer. And then there's a family of five right now that was referred to me by my daughter, who's in, who's in, uh, who actually lives and works in Armenia, which is in the region. And actually, I'd like to talk about some effects, domino effects to other former Soviet countries that are already feeling the impact of this war in Ukraine. But a referral came from a family of five that's in a shelter in Berlin, but is being kicked out in two days and they don't know where to go and have no language skills whatsoever and are trying to do their visa applications, trying to get that biometric. So it's one hurdle after the other. You know, you think even they're in a safe country like Germany and they're facing these issues of where do we go if we can't get the biometrics as required by the Canadian visa office in time until our visa application expires that we've already submitted and, and stuff like that. So, and, and the, the, the really sad, the, one of the saddest stories I think that I have dealt with in the last couple of days is a young guy by the name of Dan. He's 17 years old and his mother has literally pushed him to a village on the border with Poland and his visa application is submitted. He's been invited to do his biometrics, but his grandmother is dying and he's very close to her and he doesn't want to leave. So he's got 30 days to either cross the border to Poland, but he is torn and he continues to stay in this village where his grandma is, which happens to be close to the border. And it, you sense this struggle of what am I supposed to do as a 17 year old guy who, who has English skills, who has IT skills, has this whole life in front of him. He turns 18 in May. He feels guilty because really he feels like he should stay and fight because when he turns 18, he's no longer allowed to leave Ukraine. Right. So he's got this this window of the, the grandmother, the situation of the grandmother dying that he's grappling with and grappling with his mother, pushing him out to save his life or him staying in Ukraine until he turns 18 and gets called to the military. So again, I'm going to pause there. I could go on and on. I mean, it's just <laughs> the, the uniqueness of these stories yeah. is, is crazy. And, and what people morally are also grappling with, you know, what, 
what do I, as a 70 year old kid, how do I decide what to do? Yeah. And, and just to clarify for my office, my audience, the audience, I, I was chuckling a little bit about you're saying you're going to pa pause for a moment. Certainly not about the circumstances. Um, I live in the Sacramento area in California, and I've been told we have about 600,000 Eastern Europeans in this area. Uh, the church I go to, House of Prayer Sac Sacramento, we have a number of people that are either from the Ukraine or currently have family in the Ukraine. Um, so we've had prayer sessions for them, that type of thing, and, and talk of how we can be supportive. I'm curious in, in what you brought up with the 17-year-old. I mean, as you say, it, that's incredibly challenging. And no one can make those decisions for him, but provide him the opportunity for whatever decision he wants to make. I am, I am going to go back to one thing, though. So um, a lot of what I'm hearing you say is that people are individually, you know, making decisions. How do I support? How much do I, you know, stay involved, keep track, that type of thing. But are you hearing anything from um, leaders in business and anyone making a decision to kind of their company culture is the type where they say, hey, this is going on in the Ukraine. Do we as an organization want to do anything or are any of you individually struggling with this and we can help you out in any way? So I've heard the, can you help me out in any way? Reach out. I have not heard yet of the sort of pooled funding campaign. I'm sure it exists. But in response to this question that you asked about how can leaders be supportive in this situation? I think the first thing is to model their own behavior of giving and to even ask the question, how are you feeling and is anyone impacted by this war indirectly or directly? Because some people will, even without any connection to Ukraine, have a, a sense of closeness to the situation because of past experience in another country or just because they're extremely empathic people and might want to talk about it. So to create a safe space for, for listening and sharing you know, I don't want to call it a team building exercise, but but it is possible for a leader who is able to hold space for psychological safety and hold space for maybe a this type of non-business unusual communication to arise such that people have a vehicle to share emotion and share concern when maybe that's not even a typical thing that we do, because this is so big. This is the biggest refugee crisis since World War II. And I believe the, the caring leader, the strong leader, the empathic leader, that they will all be able to step up and hold space for this conversation and initiate the conversation. I think to me personally, I think that is the duty of every leader to do, to, to listen to what's going on in, in their field, their social field of employees, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, I, if, if they if I, invite, yeah. people will talk. Yeah, I think that's a good thing. I think that the leader doesn't even have to take necessarily a position, but but to say, hey, I know this is impacting some of you potentially. Anybody need to talk about this? And you can dial it back. I mean, I, I hope that leaders would have done that when the George Floyd thing happened in the US. Okay. And once again, you, you may not have all the data where you want to take a position yet, but obviously it's impacting people. And, you know, how can we support you? How can we be there for you? And it, I, I think it's important you can do, you need to do that sincerely. And also, if there are any things that come up of fundraising or donating or whatever, that you do have a person on your team that vets that. It's a horrible thing to say, but you don't want somebody who's an opportunist and not ethical taking advantage of a situation and siphon, siphoning off money where it should not go. But where you're, you know, I, I think this thing where you want to bond with your team and, and remember, um, you and you and I are probably on the same page. Employees at every level want to know that you have your back and that you sincerely care about them. You value them. It's one of the greatest retention strategies there is. And this is a great opportunity for you to step forward and say, hey, I may not know everything. I may not have the solution, but who needs some help out there? How can we, you know, give you some type of support, even if it's just to voice your concerns? and do that in an appropriate manner. What I personally have found difficult is listening to the stories of the companies who have pulled out of Russia and the companies who are still in Russia. 
And when I heard, you know, I was a partner in both PricewaterhouseCoopers and Ernst & Young in, based in Moscow. So I spent 15 years working in those two firms there and building teams. And when I heard that the big four pulled out, the first thing I thought to myself was, yeah, that's the right thing to do. Absolutely, you can't operate in Russia in this situation. But then immediately a second later, I thought, oh my gosh, what is happening to all those teams that I built between 1995 and 2010? Yep. They are losing their livelihoods. They are losing their jobs. And today there was this article about the French firm Auchan, who runs supermarkets and has, has a large presence in Russia. And their decision to stay and saying we're staying because, now maybe they're being opportunistic as well. I don't know. I don't know their company culture, but they are staying because they say if we fire everybody, if we close all of our stores, then these Russians will lose their livelihood. And I do want to emphasize the, the number of good Russians that I know, the number of Russians oh, yeah. fleeing their country, the number of Russians whose lives are in danger because they're activists. The journalists have been kicked out. So, so that's uh, or certainly the foreign journalists, the Russian journalists, are, some are still staying and risking um, 15 years in prison. But I think this, what is difficult for me to process is you know, the figurehead of the evil Putin, which he certainly is, in my opinion, and then the rest of the Russian people who I, I cannot believe that the majority of them actually want this and how to have empathy for people you hear speak Russian on the streets next to you if you're in a city where there are a lot of Russian immigrants, because I've got a, a, a very close friend in Dallas who I used to work with in Moscow, whose husband was on a business trip last week and walked into a Starbucks somewhere in California, speaking Russian to a colleague, and they were kicked out of the cafe. Right. Wow. And, and you, you know, and so, so I think we need to also think as leaders on, on that topic as well. This, 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 it's easy to say, oh, now all Russians are bad and all Ukrainians are good. Not true, right? No, that's a great point, Michelle. I mean, that's like saying, I just turned 65. That's like saying every, uh, every 65-year-old white guy's a jerk because some politician or, or other person who you know, is white and approximately my age behaved poorly. Um, and it goes the spectrum of culture, heritage, color of skin, whatever it might be. I think it's a great point. I, I think that's one thing that's very simple for leaders to bring up. Hey, and the other thing, I had a spiritual mentor years ago, and I forget the question I asked him. And he said, he paused for a moment and he said, it's complicated. And I think that's really something we need to remember, that this situation is complicated. I don't know the background of the Ukrainian leader. I don't know what that government's like. I don't really know what that country's like. I have a little bit of an idea of, of Putin. I actually have worked with Russians, contract IT people for upwards of 10 years at times. And um, I agree with you. A lot of Russians I know are wonderful people, okay? But they're now faced in this situation, kind of like when Hitler was taking over Germany, you know, do they speak up and potentially get killed or, or imprisoned? Or do they hope that there's another opportunity to peacefully resolve it while, you know, the leader is doing some very evil things? It, it's complicated, like the 17-year-old you brought up earlier. These aren't easy, cut and dry, black and white decisions that can be made. They're difficult decisions, and many of them have a cost. It's tough. I was asked by another podcast host a couple of days ago, Michelle, you worked in Russia for many years. Do you think the people could demonstrate? Do you think enough, what would get enough people out on the streets to demonstrate in Russia to overthrow Putin, et cetera? I said, look, I don't think it's safe for enough people in mass to go out and demonstrate they have they have children they have lives they can't they can't enough people can't risk that but i said i do think there is a powerful group that i also have worked with which is the cosmonauts the russian astronauts so i got to work with these people because because i'm from houston and because i was working in a russian american joint venture that was uh, doing some projects jointly with Russian cosmonauts and other Russian space engineers in connection with, with what was happening on the developments on, for the Mir space station, et cetera. This was in the early 90s. And so I have personally met 
probably 15 cosmonauts spent time with them. And, and I know American astronauts as well. I grew up with the Challenger kids in Houston and, and swam with them on swim team when, when that accident happened. So my response to this question, who can demonstrate came the day after these three Russian cosmonauts put on yellow and blue suits in the space station. And this was filmed and the question was asked, is this coincidence or are they making a comment about Ukraine in support of Ukraine because they're wearing yellow and blue? So it's not 100% clear. I like to think that they were doing something in support of peace with Ukraine because I firmly believe that if all the retired and current Russian cosmonauts would do a mini demonstration, uh, not just in space where they're safe from a bomb, but on the streets of Moscow, I don't see how Putin could put those people in jail. If let's say, I don't know, 50 of them got together, came out of retirement and just put on their put on a suit with those colors and just didn't even say anything, but walk down the street arm in arm. Honestly, I could imagine that happening and working. I can't imagine anything else being possible. Not the oligarchs, not the military, not the police. None of those professions are in a safe enough place to do that. But I think the cosmonauts are. Interesting. I think, I think it also validates how complicated it is. You have to think creatively. Who's going to have the influence, not just on Putin, but who's going to have the influence on the public to really stand up and say that? But let me let me go back to so leaders, what you're recommending, which sounds very good to me, need to not hide from potentially significant issues like this, but give people space and opportunity to dialogue about it, support one another, that type of thing. So. I think, David, um, open the invitation, actually invite. Yes. Yeah. Start the conversation, not just kind of be open to it or give the opportunity, but actually proactively invite. Yeah. Yeah. And ideally, probably not on day one, but somewhere after a week, certainly now as we've hit a month, um, there's enough information out there where and enough people impacted where um, what you're doing is you're encouraging them to invite. Let's let's. Does anybody want to talk about this? Anybody concerned about it? I mean, besides the people in my church who are being affected by this, I mean, I'm not really affected. And yet I can tell you um, about a week and a half ago, this Ukraine thing on top of some other things that were going on, I mean, it, it just crushed me. I mean, uh, to be candid, I, I was just like, whoa, this is just this like reliving history with Hitler or, you know, whether you look at Mao Zedong or, or you know, Lenin and Stalin, and, et, et cetera, many of the, the evil people who have come to power and, and massacred massive numbers of people, just, you know, it, it, it does affect. So if, we, if you were to kind of give a playbook here, a mini playbook, as we kind of close out in these next five minutes or so, what would you recommend step by step for leaders to do and consider doing with their people? to show them that you care, show them that you want to be supportive and give them an opportunity to uh, engage with people on this subject and uh, hopefully get some healing. So I think step one is to check with HR who in my employee population is of Russian heritage or Ukrainian heritage so that I have knowledge of that employee base who might be directly impacted by this and so that I can reach out to them very personally and individually to see how they might need support. To me, that is step one is understanding that employee base. Great. And step number two is in whatever normal staff meeting or dialogue forum, as de and depending on how large the company is, I think your audience is, is company size, 100, 100 people or so. Maybe that's a small enough size as, as a CEO or as a president to invite a dialogue, invite kind of like office hours on this to anyone who wants to join. And that way the leader is inviting the conversation and holding a safe space for empathic dialogue to arise. And if the company is too large for that, to sit with the management team and coach them on how to do this so that they can have these meetings. But I do think it is much more powerful if it's coming from the CEO and if the CEO is then also sharing how they have given to 
an organization that they trust and believe in that is helping refugees or helping the Red Cross provide supplies or whatever it might be. There are a diverse number of organizations that people will have trust in and the leader can just model that giving as well. Yeah. And the CEO should consider making time if they need to go division by division or work group department, whatever by department and participating with that leader of that department or division, maybe let them take a lead, but you're there and you're also commenting to support um, that would the, be ideal. the dialogue and what's going on. Yeah. yeah. I think that's great advice. Yeah. And if there are people in the employee population that have family in Ukraine, give them some time off, ask them what they need. How can we help? Because the psychological trauma and the worry, imagine if you had, if you had children or parents in Mariupol and, and that city is, is decimated and you don't know how many people are alive. You don't know who's alive left in that place. Yeah. Yeah. And then some practical things like what you brought up on the, the help with the visas, you know, or push with push with politicians, you know, here in the States, if that's needed to get something done, because it is surprising sometimes what you can get done by contacting your congressman or congresswoman and asking for help on something. And sometimes they really they do come through. They have staff and the visa thing can be a big item some practical blocking and tackling type of things. Yeah. So um, what, where would you recommend people go if they want to get a little bit more information? So I um, have, I can give you the link, or I have already given you link to the GoFundMe page that my personal friend's husband has started. So this is, this is a, a very personal GoFundMe page, and it is just one that I simply trust 100%, that this will go... To, to something that normally would not be funded by the Red Cross, because this is funding the father of my very close friend in Toronto, who is serving internal refugees in Ukraine, fleeing from Kharkiv in his sanatorium. And this will be an unnoticed giving platform because people will donate to the, the, the habitual ones, which are, which are fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing that either. Um, but the habitual ones are helping all of those refugees who have already made it to Poland, Hungary, or Germany, or where else, right? Or, or okay. Canada. Yeah. There's plenty of help coming there. But let's not forget the people inside Ukraine who couldn't get out or who don't want to get out and also need help. And so... Yeah. I well, we'll definitely that put that, to, that link in the description of the podcast page. so um, they've got that. Yeah. And also, um, you know, post, post your link over at uh, LinkedIn or, or wherever. And so if they want to ask you any questions, if that, is that okay Absolutely. if they want to reach out to you? Okay. And if anybody um, knows people in Ukraine or any Ukrainian citizen living in Russia, living in any of these territories where it's uh, dangerous for them, they are all eligible. If you have a Ukrainian passport, you're eligible to apply for the Canada emergency visa, which travel visa, which comes with a two, I think they've now even extended it to a three-year open work permit. So they can land in Canada and they can work. That's awesome. Uh, so I have more information on that. And I'm helping people, uh, as I said, with language or internet issues, uh, navigate that visa application. And so I will, I will help anyone who comes along. That's great. And I'm reminded, um, one of the gals in our church, young gal, her parents are actually over there and their church, um, they made it a sanctuary also. And, and they, people have donated. Beautiful. So they're just, you know, getting basic food supplies, et cetera. I think that originally they had um, room for about 200 and now they're up over 400 that they're just squeezing the cots in or the beds or whatever yeah. and, and making it work so they can help them transition and go where they, they need to go. So this is awesome. So we're going to get this out um, pretty quickly. And I really want to thank you. I think you've had phenomenal perspective here, Michelle. And I really appreciate everything that you're doing to help these people. And I hope some leaders step up and engage with their, their people in their organization and also, you know, look at what they can do. Thank you for the platform to talk about this. 